Hello, BookTube. Uh, a little bit of a background change this time, but I didn't want to uh, sit down at my desk again. A little, uh, a little bit inconvenient, uh, just the positioning wise and where to put my books and stuff. So uh, anyways, this video is my video on Homer. And uh, a little bit of background. Uh, I started my Western canon reading list. And the first two books I had on my reading list uh, were Homer, uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad. And uh, mostly this book, uh, this video will be discussing the Iliad because I just read that one like a week ago. Um, the Odyssey I read back in, in um, October and I do of course remember, uh, remember it um, enough that I can discuss it a little bit, but not as uh, in depth as I would like because that's a few months, that's, you know, over 30 days ago, and uh, almost two months ago, actually. Um, so, so I'll do my best with that one, but um, I'm going to start off with the uh, discussing the Iliad from, from Homer. So this is the translation that I read. It is the W, was it W H D Rose uh, prose translation. Yeah, it's in prose. Um, it was a good translation. I I uh, liked it uh, as a different as a contrast to uh, the translation I read last year. Uh, last summer I read the Fagel's translation, which is in verse, and uh, so reading it in prose, uh, it really gave it a different perspective uh, on on how uh, it is written. So I could read it without trying to um, fit it in within the lines of the verse because uh, one thing uh, that I've noticed about myself is that when I read poetry, I'm always trying to fuss over how the lines work and if there's a rhyming scheme and whatnot. And that always distracts me from what I'm actually reading in the poem. And uh, I mean, Fagels isn't in, in rhyming in uh, any kind of rhyming verse, at least not usually. So uh, it's not, it doesn't trip you up that way, but this one, it gives you more perspective on the dialogue and how long they talk for. And, and uh, it's a lot more colloquial, which is what this, is, this translation is advertised as. Um, but anyways, um, the, uh, I'll discuss the Iliad. The Iliad is a story of, uh, of the rage of Achilles, which is what the first line says. It's literally just, uh, it takes place near the end of the 10 year siege of Troy uh, by the Greeks. And uh, we start off with a conflict between Agamemnon and uh, Achilles. And they both have wounded egos over something that happens and uh, Agamemnon takes it out on on Achilles of all people. And so Achilles swears off his loyalty to the Greeks for the time being uh, and uh, refuses to fight for the Greeks, which is a big deal because he's by far their best warrior. And uh, he says so himself. And he's not afraid to mention that many, many times that he's the one who, who led uh, different sieges of different cities. Like when they were, before they reached Troy, they or during their uh, siege of Troy, they would uh, uh, sail over to lesser cities and, and uh, destroy them for their goods. Because if you're sieging a, a city for 10 years, that's a long time. And so they needed supplies and, and uh, gold and whatnot. They needed goods and food and all the essentials. And, and Achilles is... Um, Major, was a major player in that. We don't get any of that in here because this uh, this is all just them at Troy, but they they uh, they mention that as they talk. Um, but the most the interesting thing about this story, or what the question that I had when I was reading this story is wh why why out of all stories must the rage of Achilles become uh, the story, why is it worth an epic is basically my question. Because Achilles is such a jerk throughout this, this entire book or this entire poem. 
And he's not someone you want to root for at all. And I don't think – I'm pretty sure Homer doesn't want you – isn't expecting you to root for him, um, so, which means there's got to be another, another motive about why this tale is worth being told, especially since it's, it's uh, longer than the Odyssey. Um, because Achilles, because of uh, his wounded ego, he prays to the gods to, or he inquires of the gods through his mother to have uh, the Greeks fail in battle just so that they're, just so that he can get back at Agamemnon. And so many, many Greeks, uh, Greek warriors that, are, that were on his own side are slaughtered in battle. And a lot of his, his friends, um, the, the um, like Odysseus and uh, uh, Ajax and Diomedes, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Um, they're all friends of his, uh, and they a lot of them get wounded in battle, and all because of his ego. Um, so it's a, incredibly reckless, and I don't think he's he's not, and he just sits there and, and mopes around, and, and of course. At the end, uh, uh, near the end, when uh, his best friend Patroclus is, is killed, that's only when it, uh, it snaps into his his brain uh, the consequences of his petty actions um, and his petty um, uh, prayer to the gods just to get back at Ag Agamemnon. It's ridiculous. And... Um, and that leads to the other interesting thing is the role of the gods in this book. The gods are such a, they're basically just superhuman, they're just, they're like superheroes. Uh, I, I think I've heard someone say, uh, uh, compare the Iliad to, um, it's basically a fantasy epic um, because you got superheroes in the form of gods. They're just like humans. They argue and they're petty and they uh, have their good moments and their bad moments, and uh, uh, but they just happen to be immortal and, and um, way more powerful than any human being uh, with supernatural powers. And it's really interesting to see how invested they are in the Battle of Troy, which leads, which is why it's taking so long. And the, taking like the siege of Troy, like ten years. That's a really, really long time. Uh, just for to siege a city, and the, the reason why they're sieging the city is because of uh, Agamemnon's uh, brother Menelaus's uh, wife was stolen by, or taken by Paris, and uh, Helen of Troy is, is uh, behind the walls. We get a little bit of her respect, her perspective too, which which I find interesting, um, because in one one sense she likes where she is now, but in in another sense she misses her old her older her previous life, and uh, and of course she's aware that she's the reason for this conflict in the first place, and uh, it's a it's an interesting really interesting book and. Another aspect of the book, I can't say I, one of the aspects I did not, I enjoyed the least, I should say, is the battles, the battle scenes. Because there's a lot of detailed battle scenes in here where we get uh, this warrior uh, uh, attacked this warrior and we get explicit, really uh, up close details of how these people are killed. And the most interesting thing about Homer in these battle scenes is when he uh, personalizes the people. Like he'll introduce someone, give a little bit of their background of their family family situation, and then have them slaughtered in in like the next line. And it's um, it's interesting, an interesting take on war. And but the the thing that I don't like about it is just how it pauses the entire narrative. We get pages and pages and pages of people being slaughtered in battle. And it, it's basic, it, it stops the narrative completely. We don't get the story. What is uh, one obscure figure slaughtering another obscure figure? What does that have to do with the rage of Achilles? It doesn't, it really doesn't, except for maybe to drive home the pettiness of, of, of Achilles uh, uh, 
rage and how it's having real consequences to real people. But even then, he doesn't need to do that every single battle scene again and again and again. I mean, and there was some great stuff in here, too. My personal favorite was uh, book, um, what was it, book 21? In that, in that scene, we have Achilles. Uh, he's back in the battles. Uh, he's back fighting now after Patroclus has died and he's bent on revenge. And uh, uh, he's uh, attacking the, uh, the Trojan warriors and he's basically invincible because he's so much uh, better a fighter and he's just slaughtering them in left and right. And at one point he, ch uh, he pushes them across the, the, the river there near Troy. And in Homer's world, Homer, uh, um, the rivers, each river has its own god, or each river is a god. And this god is really upset at, at uh, Achilles, not only for clogging up his, his river with dead bodies, but for also killing the Trojans because the Trojans had sacrifice, uh, made sacrifices to this god uh, because he's so close to their city. And uh, so he's partial to them. And he rises up and start, and sends this massive wave after Achilles. And Achilles has to, uh, we get a very, uh, we get the details of Achilles where he's, he's running just ahead of this wave. So he's just fast enough that he's out, out running this huge wave where, where we told that if he paused even for an instant, this wave that's over his shoulder high would hit against him. And of course, he'd be swept away in the waters. Um, and it goes on for like that for a while into, until the, uh, the gods who are in favor of the Greeks, and Achilles especially, um, have to um, get, get that river god to stop. And uh, they do it through fire. And I thought that was a really cool scene. And in that same book, we also get the gods fighting against, uh, fighting against each other. For the uh, really for the first time, the gods are all throughout this book, either in disguise or uh, helping certain warriors on each side, either Hector or um, Ajax or other other warriors. They um, inspire them and they they uh, deflect um, spears and and different things, um, and they play a big part in Patroclus's death as well. But they're not, they don't ever fight against each other, uh, God against God, until book 21. And I found that a really fascinating sequence of events, uh, especially since uh, the goddess Athena is more powerful than the goddess, uh, the god of war, Ares. And uh, that's not something that you would normally think of when you think of, you know, this god is the god of war, and therefore he's the best warrior. He's not, because we got Athena. And she rubs it into his face and how she's superior to him. And it's really great. Uh, and uh, I also really love the, uh, there's, there, there's two touching moments in this book or in this uh, epic poem. And the first one is the obvious one. It's the, the one where Hector goes back to uh, Troy and he um, has that moment, really good moment with his, uh, with his family, with his wife and with his uh, young son. And it's a really touching moment before he goes out to battle again. Uh, and uh, the other touching moment is at the very end when um, King uh, Hector's father, after Hector has been killed by Achilles, Achilles has Hector's body. And uh, uh, the king, was it King Priam or something? Um, he, uh, the gods allow him or give him safe passage all the way to Achilles' tent, right in the middle of the Greek, uh, and in the in the middle of the night, uh, in the Greek camp, to collect Hector's body. And Hector, or no, uh, King Priam, he's really old and he's gray and he's uh, uh, mourning. He's been mourning for his son for a long time, or ever since his son had died. And we got Achilles, and they meet face to face. And uh, he, uh, King Priam, he invokes, 
uh, um, Achilles to remember, uh, see him as like he sees his father. Because Achilles has a father who's waiting for him, uh, waiting for him back home. But according to his fate, which Achilles is well aware of, he will never be going back home because he's gonna, he knows he's going to die in battle in Troy. And so uh, he gets a, he has this moment of, of uh, empathy where he weeps not only for, uh, for his father and he weeps for King Priam because he sees King Priam's perspective and he sees this old man who reminds him like his father and, uh, and he gives in and, and lets him take home Hector's body. But there's just that really, that one scene where this old man is staring into the face of this young man and, who murdered his son and his Achilles is staring into the face of the father of the man he just murdered or the, the man he, he murdered. And it, it's such a touching moment. I really love that moment. And we end with Hector's funeral and that's just when this drops off. Some people think the ending right at uh, Hector's funeral is kind of, uh, is, a, is abrupt. I don't, necessarily think so because the point is that this is the rage of Achilles and at that moment with King Priam and with Hector's death Achilles rage is has been abated really it's not so there's really no more story based on what Homer had set up himself had set up at the very beginning and uh, so that's really my thoughts on on the Iliad and a little bit on the Odyssey. Um, I read the Fagel's translation for this. This is my first time ever reading, um, reading uh, the Odyssey. Uh, this one is in verse, um, and I thought that was, I thought it was a good translation. Um, I took a lot of notes reading this book. I took a lot of notes, and it took me about a month to get through. Not because it was difficult or anything. It's just because uh, I had university classes, and so I wasn't prioritizing this book. I wanted to s slow read this. Um, I personally liked this more than the Iliad. Um, this because the um, I guess because uh, the main character is a lot more uh, a character that you want to root for. Uh, because Odysseus is, um, he's the main character. He's, it's his odyssey. Um, he's, he's a, a, a character who wants to uh, get home and just be with his family. And he's got all of these obstacles along the way. So basically the, the story is um, Odysseus is part of the Greek camp, one of the great warriors of the Greeks at the siege of Troy. After uh, Troy falls, Odysseus tries to get home, and this is the story of him trying to get home. And it takes him 10 years to get home. And along the way, he's got a whole bunch of, uh, faces a whole bunch of uh, now famous uh, episodes. You know, like the, the episode with the Cyclops, the episode with Circe, um, and the men turned, turned into cattle. Um, the, uh, the episode with the uh, the uh, sun was the, the sun god's cattle where they slaughter the sun god's cattle and in retaliation all his entire crew was killed uh, and then um, I forget the goddess's name but he's uh, she really wants to marry him and so she takes him captive onto her own island and uh, tries to persuade him to marry him and she offers him immortality, but he rejects immortality because he just wants to get home to be with his wife and be with his son and be back in, in his own uh, homeland. And uh, at the end, he does get home finally. Uh, but the ending doesn't, it doesn't end there. We get a long, se uh, a long sequence where he's uh, in disguise in his own homeland because there's suitors at, at the uh, at his uh, own palace because uh, he's been gone for almost 20 years or he'd been gone for 20 years uh, when he gets home and uh, his wife and his son both 
lose hope that he's ever coming home. And so there's a bunch of suitors who see his, uh, his wife as eligible for marriage again. And uh, they basically uh, take over his, Odysseus's house and uh, have every day they have feasts in his place waiting for, uh, for uh, Penelope to choose who she'll marry, but she keeps putting them off. And through, uh, but the, the story is not told in that chronological order uh, because the very first, was it eight, seven or eight books? Uh, we get, we get us, uh, we start off near the end of those 10 years when Odysseus uh, is trying to get home, but we, we get the perspective of Odysseus's wife and his son and how um, Ithaca, which is his homeland, how they are doing with uh, without Odysseus for so long, and uh, it's basically um, a coming of age story with for uh, uh, Odysseus's son because he was just a, a very small child when Odysseus left for the Trojan War, and now he's you know in his early twenties, and uh, now he's coming into his own just as the the story starts, and uh, he has given up hope that his father will come home, but every time there's a little fraction of hope, he still wants to pursue it. He still has, even though he says that he's given up hope, he really hasn't given up hope because he, he, uh, he he's still asking strangers about whether or not they've heard of, of his father, and there's a point where he even leaves to uh, talk to other uh, veterans of the Trojan War and to see what they have to say, if they've heard anything of his father. And that takes up the first few books, or first seven or so books. And when we finally see Odysseus, he's uh, on the island with that goddess, uh, just sitting there weeping because he can't do anything. Uh, he can't leave, and he refuses to accept her offer. And so she just keeps him there. And uh, Athena, at, that, at this point, who's basically his, uh, the goddess who's looking out for him, finally lets him go free from this place and uh but first uh, he uh has a stop stoppage at the was it the feekins or something fee uh, i can't say it but he has another stop uh that he has to take before he is allowed to return home and it's there sitting in their um in their hall after a feast where he uh is asked asked to tell his story and uh, then we get from Odysseus's mouth himself his own story about how uh, he was he, uh, the first eight years of his travels after the Trojan War and we get it straight from his mouth about what all happened and uh, it's really interesting I, uh, it's a really interesting story um, I did find the ending when he actually when he's done when he's finally brought home uh, he's uh, he has to be disguised as an old man uh, because uh, the gods disguise him as an old man because if he came home and just walked right in, all, uh, all the suitors would team up and kill him because he's just one man, and so he has to bide his time in disguise in his own in his own house. His son knows who he is and uh, keeps his secret, but he has to abide his time, and through all that time where he's uh, abiding his time, uh, when will be the right moment to strike, to see who of his own household and of his own city uh, are still loyal to him and who are not. He has to, uh, before he can rise up and reclaim his position, that those moments at the very end, or that, uh, that um, ending, it takes a really long time to commence. And I found that really, it got quite tedious at one moment because we're told many, many times what's going to happen. He's going to, he's got the, the God's blessings on his side. And he's got everything on his side. Yet he just, a day after day, he's, he's uh, showing up to his own household in, the, in the, the disguise as an old man, as a guest to his son. And so the suitors are taunting him. They're mocking him. They're, um, uh, 
throwing stuff at him. Um, they're being really rude to him. And uh, he just uh, bears it all and uh, uh, keeps his rage down until the, the moment when um, he finally uh, gathers some followers, including his son, and they uh, uh, trap in the suitors and slaughter them all. I just found that the, the lead up to that moment really tedious because there's a moment where Athena goes up to Odysseus and tells him explicitly, you know, there's no way you're going to lose. We got, we fully back you. This is, a, um, you're guaranteed to win. And yet he still has doubts about whether he's going to win. And he still has doubts about um, if he's strong enough by uh, uh, to trap in the gods or to not the gods, the suitors. And, and I found that really strange. He's told many, many times that he's guaranteed to win. And yet he keeps abiding his time and keeps putting it off. And uh, I don't know, maybe that's just a small quibble or a small quibble, but uh, I just found that they got tedious at the end. And then the, the ending too was really weird because he, uh, the suitors are not just anybody. They're actual princes and uh, prominent figures from around who that live in or around the island in different uh, royal settings. And so when he kills them all, of course, he's going to have all these, the, this huge backlash, which almost certainly will lead to them overthrowing him because he's just uh, one man in one, uh, in his uh, kingdom or against many other kingdoms that will uh, retaliate against him. And, uh, but that's cut off because the gods just, uh, jump in, create peace, and this thing ends. So I found this a, a more abrupt ending than the Iliad, honestly. And I found, but I did find this story a lot more enjoyable than, uh, not a lot, but more enjoyable than than uh, the Iliad, because there I didn't find I didn't think there was as many. Uh, I found the story and Odysseus himself to be way more um, interesting to read. And uh, so it's, I didn't have to read about someone whining for so long uh, and creating just unimaginable amounts of havoc for his own people. Instead, we actually get a, an interesting story of retrib retribution and conflict uh, where you actually want Odysseus to succeed and you want Odysseus, uh, you feel bad for Odysseus. And, I found that um, more engaging as a story overall. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts on Homer. Um, tell me what you think. Have you read these stories before? And uh, uh, what have you, did you enjoy them? Would you ever think of picking them up? Um, I know some people think they're intimidating. I don't, I didn't find them intimidating. I just, I found them uh, just stories that are really old and that, stuff that interests me and uh, the influence that they uh, bring about is really uh, really important I think which is why I started off with Homer uh, my next video I did finish just this morning actually I finished uh, the next uh, book on my list my western canon reading list which is the myths of Me Mesopotamia which includes the epic of Gilgamesh uh, I hope to do a video on that soon. I don't know when, but sometime soon. Um, we'll see how soon I get my thoughts together, and uh, I'll make a video on that. Uh, yeah, whenever I get around to it. Uh, thank you, BookTube.